A chance discovery takes us on a journey deep in time to a lost age, unlike anything you've ever known. A prehistoric world where the middle of North America lay submerged beneath a sea of strange creatures. Now, National Geographic Entertainment brings us an epic adventure, 82 million years in the making. Before they lived in our imagination, they really lived. Sea Monsters, a prehistoric adventure. of years, we thought dinosaurs ruled the Earth as scaly reptilian beasts. Huge lizards that terrorize the landscape. But new science is proving us wrong. And one tiny bird-like creature is dismantling our most deeply held beliefs about the great T-Rex and his ground-shaking, meat-eating brethren. Sometimes, ordinary people make extraordinary discoveries. A shepherd stumbled on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Teenagers found the cave paintings of Lascaux. And in 1996, with one swing of his pick, a Chinese farmer revolutionized our understanding of the dinosaurs. His blade struck an ancient rock. Inside, the fossil of a peculiar turkey-like creature. It was clearly a dinosaur, but the imprints in the rock showed strange new features. This dinosaur was covered with what looked like feathers. There was a buzz, there was like a rumor that feather dinosaurs had been discovered in Northeast China. The find sent shockwaves through the paleo world. An astonishing discovery that will forever change what we thought we knew about dinosaurs. Immediately upon seeing it, we knew that this was really a smoking gun, but totally unexpected. I mean, something we never would have believed we would find. The new discovery, named Sinoceropteryx, was about two feet tall, with a small head, teeth of a meat eater, a long tail, and primitive filament-like feathers. These feathers could only be seen because of the rare conditions under which they were preserved. A volcanic eruption buried the creature in soft ash locking in all its secrets before it could decompose. And it wasn't the only one. The find kicked off a dinosaur gold rush in the region. Over the next decade, hundreds of feathered dinos were found. And paleontologists began piecing together theories about what the feathers meant.
they forced an immediate shift in our perceptions of dinos. What they looked like, how their bodies worked, and how they behaved. The one thing all the feathered dinos shared, they were all predatory meat eaters, the most fearsome killers in the prehistoric world. Reptile-like creatures we wouldn't expect to be covered in feathers. The implications were scientifically astounding. The possibilities, quite comical. One species in particular sparked the imagination. The most ferocious, iconically reptilian dinosaur of them all. Tyrannosaurus rex. All of a sudden, scientists had to adjust their image of big bad T-Rex. If the ancestors and the relatives of T-Rex all had feathers of some sort, then we know for sure that group would have retained them in some way. But did T-Rex have feathers? Was he covered with downy fuzz or bright, colorful plumage? Did he behave more like a predatory bird than a giant lizard? Was our dark, historical picture of him badly misguided? To find out what T-Rex was really like, scientists would need to take a closer look at the feathered coats of his relatives from China. It seemed smooth scales were out and feathers were in. Now, to figure out what they were for. Feathers are used for lots of different things. I mean, they can be used for hunting, they can be used for display, they can be used for insulation. Modern birds provide some intriguing examples. The ptarmigan, which lives in the Arctic, uses feathers for warmth and changes color each season to hide from predators. The snowy plover uses its feathers to attract attention. When its nest is threatened, it lures predators away by acting injured, fanning its rust-colored tail and beating its wings. The predator goes after the seemingly crippled bird, and the nest stays safe. And the male peacock flaunts its brilliant fan of iridescent tail feathers to attract a mate. These feather uses are all behavioral, but color is what makes them effective. That left scientists wondering whether the same had been true of dinosaur feathers. The problem was, no one knew of any way to extract color information from fossilized feathers. An exploration of color seemed like a scientific dead end. Until 2006, that is, when a chance discovery in a very different kind of animal offered a new avenue of attack. The man studying it, Yale graduate student Jakob Vinter. The animal, the squid. Squids are pretty awesome. They use colors in all sorts of complex ways. They can change color. They communicate with each other in color. They can actually express emotions with color. They can also spew black ink when threatened, creating a smoke screen in the water to confuse would-be predators. Mm -hmm. 
Jakob was examining a fossilized squid sample when he noticed something strange in its ink sac. Dark round blobs. They looked like the granules of pigment that give squid ink its color. But he'd never seen them in a fossil before, so he'd always assumed they didn't get preserved. Eager to see if they really were fossilized ink droplets, he sought out some fresh samples for comparison. Can, can I have those two? Yeah, sure. Under the microscope, Jakob saw a perfect match between the fossilized pigment and the pigment from the fresh samples. These squids are about 200 million years old. So it came as a big surprise when we looked at these uh, fossilized ink samples and realized that they look exactly like the modern squid ink. The magnitude of his find hit hard. If squid fossils held color, other fossils might as well. Jakob knew feathers contained pigment in tiny, durable containers called melanosomes. He wondered if they could survive fossilization. Then I was thinking about dinosaurs. Maybe we can put colors on a dinosaur with this sort of discovery. Or more specifically, the fossilized feathered dinos. Suddenly, the squid man had become a dinosaur hound. But if he was going to transform the field of paleontology, he couldn't do it alone. His team of heavy hitters, Derek Briggs, fossil preservation specialist. Rick Prum, bird expert. And Julia Clark, paleontologist. Immediately, I realized that if melanosomes were preserved in feathers, there was a great opportunity to reconstruct the plumage color of the feathered dinosaurs, which of course is uh, uh, as fascinating a question as there could be. That was extremely exciting. Figuring out what kinds of interesting questions we could ask, what kinds of specimens might be the best for the project. It was a, a fascinating um, set of questions to start considering. Questions that might not only lead to a means of coloring long extinct dinosaurs, but to a new understanding of how they behaved and what they were like. To make it all happen, they'll need to gain access to a precious feathered dino sample. And for that, they'll need to go to China. China's Liaoning province is the world capital of feathered dino fossils. It's here that Jakob Winter, Derek Briggs, Rick Prom, and Julia Clark hope to find a rare sample they can use to bring a dinosaur's color back to life. Two days of traveling gets them to the capital city of Shenyang, where they meet up with Chinese paleontologist Gao Kachin. But the long trip is only the beginning of their journey. Once in Shenyang, they must navigate the tricky waters of Chinese dinosaur politics. There's a, a lot of interest in these materials, and uh, gaining access and uh, negotiating collaborations is always a big part of uh, doing science in China. To that end, 
their first appearance is at a lavish dinner to pay their respects to their Chinese hosts. Small gift. <laughs> the team raves about the dinner, but the next day, their hopes of easy access to the fossils are unceremoniously dashed. When they arrive at the local museum, the curator refuses to let them take samples. He's worried their technique will damage his specimens. The kind of work we do involves taking samples of spectacular specimens. And inevitably, uh, a curator's job is to ensure that his material is kept uh, pristine and beautiful. So that's inevitably a little bit of a, a challenge. Stonewalled, the team seeks out the museum director for help. After some political maneuvering, he overrules his curator and agrees to give them one special sample from the back. It's an ancient crow-sized creature with well-developed feathers that seem promising. But as they take turns examining it, their excitement turns to concern. Some of the feathers look like they've been artificially enhanced. The feathers have been painted in, in a really very skillful way onto the surface. So when you look at the specimen as a whole, it, it looks uh, very real. But once you see them under the lens, it's, uh, it's perfectly obvious where it's real and where it's not. Touching up fossils for display purposes is quite common and a far cry from the all-out fakes that disreputable dealers often try to palm off to inexperienced buyers. But for the team, the enhancement makes large sections of the creature unusable. They take what they can get, but realize this specimen is not going to provide the samples they need to give a dinosaur back its color. Fortunately, their dinner diplomacy provides another lead. One of their Chinese colleagues introduces them to Li Chuangguo, okay. a paleontologist at the Museum of Natural History in Beijing. Li offers them special access to the museum's extensive collection. The best fossils are stored in the basement vaults. Oh, it's a nice one. Many still embedded in their original rocks. We were opening them. We were looking for ones that would be the best candidates for sampling. Okay. You want to go straight back, Jacob? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, that's good. Here. Amid the jumble of ancient rocks and bones, one creature stands out. Wow. There's some well-preserved feathers. It's not microraptor, is it? Basically, the specimen had extremely well-preserved feathers that had not yet been touched. They hadn't been uh, prepared. They hadn't been coated in a preservative material. You can actually see the barbs. That's just amazing. It was not ready for display, but it was perfect for sampling. You could see the nice details in them. We have these long feathers extending from the arms and the legs. And what we also could see was hints of color patterns. The animal is covered with feathers. Even its feet and toes sprout downy fluff. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. The samples they get from the creature will drive the next part of their challenge to tease the fuzzy creature's colors from the ancient rock, uncover its identity, 
and see whether it holds the key to unlocking the mysteries of the feathered colored dinos. The team leaves China with high hopes of unleashing color onto the ancient dinosaur world. The long trip back to the U.S. gives them time to consider the exciting potential of their work. If they can isolate the fossilized dino melanosomes, they may soon be able to turn fantasy and imagination into colorful fact. Back in his lab at Yale, Jakob's first task is to find the melanosomes in their samples. Because a fossil is a flattened 2D representation of a 3D animal, He's struggling to separate out individual feathers to analyze. It didn't look like a slam dunk. We were unsure whether we'd have melanosome preservation at all in the sample. So you have to say we were crossing our fingers and hoping for the best. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't a sure thing. While Jakob wrestles with the melanosomes, Julia turns her focus to the identity of their fossil. If she can figure out what it is, she might be able to shed light on why it had feathers in the first place. Cross-referencing it with other feathered dinos, she realizes it's Anchiornis huxleyi, a chicken-sized meat-eater with a toothed beak. Strange long feathers on its arms and legs and the bizarre fluff between its toes and on its feet. Its thick body feathers form a cozy coat, something paleontologist Mark Norell is excited to see. Mark believes the feathers are indicators of a colossal shift in dinosaur physiology, a shift from cold-blooded to warm. I think that keeping warm is a big part of the evolution of feathers. I'm not saying that they were warm-blooded in the same sense that modern birds are, but they're on their way to becoming warm-blooded. A change from cold-blooded to warm meant the dinos were probably becoming more active with a higher metabolism, acting more like fidgety birds than lazy reptiles. Mark's theory flies in the face of conventional wisdom that dinosaurs were reptilian. But it's based on some compelling evidence. In 2004, he and a colleague discovered a tiny bird-like dinosaur fossilized in an incredibly lifelike pose. It had its head tucked between its body and its arm. And in the same exact position that living birds tend to sleep in. And the reason that birds do that is because they're warm-blooded. You're able to maintain heat that way. Small, warm-blooded creatures are especially vulnerable to heat loss, which is why Mark believes his find was so cozily wrapped up. But what about the big guys? Would T-Rex and his plus-size compatriots also have needed a full, fluffy coat to keep warm? Well, scientists would say yes and no. This has to be investigated, but many people have hypothesized that these dinosaurs had lots of feathers which were used for insulation when they were young, but as they grew older and got bigger, um, they probably would have diminished that feather coating. 
They may not have lost them completely, so even an adult T-Rex may have had amusing tufts of feathers or flashes of color on the head or down the side of the body or along the middle of the back, perhaps just for visual display and not any longer for any kind of temperature control. It's a tactic still used by today's biggest birds. We see that even in ostriches when the, the chicks hatch, that they're completely covered with fluff. But then as the animals get bigger and bigger and bigger, they lose all the feathers on their neck, they lose a lot of the feathers on their legs, and also their feather density on the body itself becomes much more limited. For T-Rex and the meat eaters, the similarities to the warm-blooded ostrich don't end there. Other fossilized remains are revealing some other very bird-like and surprisingly endearing behaviors. When this lizard-looking relative of T. rex was unearthed over a clutch of eggs in 1924, it was named Oviraptor, Latin for egg thief, because scientists thought it had been pilfering another dinosaur's eggs when it died. Oviraptor was thought to be originally eating the eggs because it was a scaly reptile. And that's kind of a uh, low life business that reptiles are in, right? But 70 years later, another Oviraptor find by Mark Norell led to a very different conclusion. We found dinosaurs sitting on top of their nests. The find an animal brooding its eggs is a, is a remarkable thing. Like, I mean, if you would have told me that we would find that a few years before, I would have said you were crazy. Like warm-blooded birds, the oviraptors were protecting their own eggs, not eating someone else's. Even more shocking, some scientists believe many of the nest sitters were male, and that males played an important role in brooding and raising the young, just like ostriches. And possibly T. rex as well, since it was a close cousin of Oviraptor. It's very likely that if we make a prediction about the parental care of Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, we would predict that it was the dad at the nest. So here's the most ferocious uh, predator uh, 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 of any human fantasy, and it turns out that they were probably good dads. Poor T. rex is becoming more bird-like every day. His fearsome reputation as a lizard-like, cold-blooded killer is being shattered by images of fuzzy babies, flamboyant patches of feathers, and stay-at-home dads. Even his posture has changed, as scientists have been forced to account for his more avian bone structure. Sadly, things will only get worse for T. rex, as startling new information about the feathered dinos comes to light. New dinosaur color revelations are emerging from New Haven, where the Yale team is starting to make some real progress on the hues of Anchiornis's coat. Jakob has finally isolated two distinct types of the color-carrying melanosomes. Sausage shapes, which would have held a black color and meatball shapes, which would have contained a reddish brown, what bird watchers call rufous red. But he also finds many other variations he doesn't recognize. Serendipitously, one of the world's leading melanosome specialists has just spent some time at Yale. Hey, man. Hey, how's it going? Come, man. 
A perfect opportunity for a color consultation. I actually got a, a kind of cryptic email from Jacobs just asking me about uh, this uh, certain shape of melanosome. After a few more emails, he wound up telling me that, that he had this great fossil specimen and that they wanted to reconstruct the color. And I was, to be honest, a bit jealous uh, that I hadn't thought of it. Intrigued, Matt quickly jumps in to help. He's an expert on color and feathers, which often go together in complex ways. They're very narrow as well. They're very narrow. Brilliant greens and blues and shimmery iridescence are produced by light bouncing off the physical structures of the feather. And most bright reds, yellows, and pinks make their way into feathers from foods the birds eat. The colors stored in melanosomes tend to be the more earthy tones. So Matt focuses his attention on those. Using his one-of-a-kind database of melanosomes and their corresponding colors, he confirms the black and reddish brown and begins to decipher the other shapes Jakob has found. There's actually this, this gradient. We found this, this intermediate between the sausage and the meatball. And then that appeared to be associated with a gray color. As Matt spits out colors, Jakob begins mapping where they belong. That was like the Cretaceous feather that we looked at, the striped feather. It's a crude paint by numbers of the ancient fossil but it's beginning to reveal amazing patterns of color, including speckles on the cheeks, stripes on the arm feathers, spots on the legs, and the biggest surprise of all, a truly debonair hairpiece. We found support for black, gray, brown, brownish red, but what I think is more exciting to me is that these were, these were patterns. Like, we could find out that the rufous color, the reddish color, was on the head. And that's interesting because that says that it was actually using these feathers for display. It was showing off its feathers to its uh, fellows. If Ankyornis was showing off for his neighbors, it means they must have been able to see what he was displaying. Turns out, we think they could. Their evidence comes from vision tests on modern crocs and birds. Many croc species have a proven ability to recognize colors. And birds have very keen color vision as well. They share the same four color receptors in their eyes. So, genetically, scientists can predict that those receptors were present in their ancient common ancestor. That common ancestor is also shared by dinosaurs. So scientists can infer that dinos evolved with color vision as well. If they're right, it means Anchiornis's companions would have been duly impressed by his conspicuous rufous red crest. Feathers may have evolved for temperature control, but other, more visual uses would soon have followed. Dominance displays, mating games, camouflage, probably all of the above. And if the team's color work pans out, the colors and patterns of Anchiornis and the other feathered dinos will reveal just how they did it. But just as they begin the final stage of the recolorization, another find uproots the dinosaur family tree yet again.
in an obscure mining town in Shandong Province, China. An intriguing new dino is making the origins of dino feathers even fuzzier than it was before. For years, it sat unexamined in a private collection until its owner turned it over to a museum. Mark Norell can't wait to take a look. How are you? Great, really great. Well, let me introduce you to the director. Yeah, I can't wait to see it. The new find is Tianya Long, a small bipedal dinosaur covered in primitive bristle-like filaments. The first specimen reveals long bristles on the throat along the backbone, and at the base of the tail. We were able to see additional specimens and to see that these bristles are completely covering the entire body. I mean, that was pretty amazing and pretty spectacular because I never expected that they would be, you know, that, that thick and that, you know, covering the whole head, the whole neck, everything. I mean, it looked like a big fuzz bulb. Interesting. But given the huge number of feathered, fuzzy, and filamented dinosaurs that have been found, it doesn't seem like much of a revelation. Until paleontologists realize where it stands in the dino family tree. Unlike every other feathered dino, Tianyulong doesn't come from the predatory line that includes T-Rex and the flesh eaters. It comes from an older plant-eating branch that featured the armor-plated, spiked, and duck-billed species, including the iconically bizarre Stegosaurus and Triceratops. If Tianyulong's bristles do turn out to be actual feathers, it would suggest that the ancestor it shared with the feathered meat-eaters might also have had some form of feathers way back at the base of the dinosaur family tree. It's a stunning new window into the earliest days of the dinosaur and indicates to a growing number of scientists that all dinosaurs may have had some form of feathers. Unfortunately, it doesn't shed much light on the way those feathers looked on a living, breathing animal. Little Anchiornis is still the great hope for that. And after all the fossil hunting, sample taking, sausage searching, and color coding, he is at last getting ready for his close-up. The team at Yale calls in world-renowned bird artist, Michael DiGiorgio, to bring him to life. I got a phone call from Rick. He says, I have a really cool project for you. And I said, sure, uh, sounds good, what is it? And I thought it was some type of uh, project with a bird. And then he told me that it was a dinosaur. This is uncharted territory. Since use often defines appearance, DiGiorgio will rely on Rick's knowledge of bird feathers and their functions to hint at what some of the dino feathers might actually have looked like. The thick body feathers, most likely for warmth. This is from a great gray owl, uh, a northern forest uh, arctic owl uh, that lives in places that are really cold. And so underneath the contour feathers of the plumage, he has a whole layer of uh, downy feathers that provide uh, uh, beautiful insulation. The red crest, probably for display. Now, this is an example of a male great curassow. These feathers are a little stiffer and slightly curly, a uh, little more specialized than we would see in Anchiornis huxleyi. 
uh, but still an example of a prominent crest uh, on a living bird and probably functions in courtship display and signaling. But the long, spangled arm and leg feathers are not as easy to decipher. And the foot feathers are still downright bizarre. One of the biggest surprises was the foot, the way the, the feathers came off the foot, which is amazing. Why would feathers, it seems like they would get in the way, right? The foot feathers are a mystery his drawing might help solve. And it's finally ready for the big color reveal. For the first time in more than 150 million years, a dinosaur will be seen in its original colorful coat. And here is our rendering of the plumage of Anchiornis huxleyi. When we thought we had an opportunity to reconstruct the color of the dinosaurs, I never expected that the first one we would work on would turn out to be so dramatic. Yeah, it looks like a big fluffy chicken with, you know, lots of leg feathers. So a very weird looking big fluffy chicken. I could see it hunting down maybe insects, um, small prey. Probably was quite a quick creature based on uh, the size of the legs. And if I had to pick a, a, a living bird that this looks the most like, it, it reminds me of a road runner. Taken together, the feathers and colors provide some fascinating clues about how Anchiornis acted. <laughs> They might circle around each other and size each other up, and maybe it flares up its feathers to display these patterns. It might be a brief skirmish, and then one of them runs away. We know Anchiornis wasn't airborne because its feathers were not aerodynamic enough for flight. But they certainly looked like they were heading in that direction. I'll be opening up a can of worms if I say it's, it, it goes up in the trees and then flaps down but you would think that maybe it would at least soften the, the landing that jumped out of a tree. It does have uh, actual fingers, so it, it probably could climb very well, and I could see it sailing from one location to another. This thing might have uh, been useful in gliding, but if they did glide, they were certainly at a very early phase of aerodynamic function. It's a theory worth further investigation. But another of the creature's more familiar features has bird expert Rick Prum pondering something bigger. The detailed patterning of its black and white feathers. The spangled plumage of the wings and the legs is really exciting uh, because it's strikingly similar uh, to the feathers of a breed of chicken. The silver spangled Hamburg chicken uh, is a domesticated chicken that has uh, beautifully white feathers with a black spangled tip. So it's a striking example of a very similar plumage pattern uh, in a living bird. The physical similarity sparks a powerful possibility. One of the interesting things about the Hamburg chicken is that the spangles are larger in females than they are in males. If the same was true of Anchiornis, a pattern comparison of additional specimens could help reveal which were males and which were females, something notoriously difficult to determine from dinosaur fossils. It could work on other dinosaurs as well, if enough samples can be found and analyzed. Who would have thought a mere chicken might provide such a windfall?
Unfortunately for the great T-Rex, that's not all the chicken can tell us. Scientists recently analyzed protein samples from a 68 million year old T-Rex leg bone. And what modern animal did they find it was most closely related to? That's right, the common chicken. Think about that next time you bite into a wing. After centuries at the sinister top of the reptilian predatory food chain, T-Rex can fall no further. From upright and scaly to feathered and bird-like, this cousin of Anchiornis and long-lost relative of the chicken has had its reputation completely shattered. His image consultants might pine for the days before new scientific techniques invaded the field of paleontology. But for the rest of us, it has opened up a whole new world. A world where one small creature named Anchiornis brought the past back to life. Where dinosaurs, crocs, and birds shared a single common ancestor. And where evolutionary trial and error left dinosaurs with an exotic collection of strange feathered coats and eerily familiar bird-like behaviors.